Welcome to the Burner Turner Show. I'm your host, Wayne Turner. Got a very special guest on the show, someone I was very privileged to play with. One year, my, my, my year at Kentucky, this guy's from Tennessee, was a McDonald's and Parade All-American. He was the 1996 Most Outstanding Player in NCAA Tournament. He was also the 16th pick in the 1996 NBA draft by the Charlotte Hornets. He was Mr. Basketball in Tennessee. Your favorite Wildcat from out of Brownsville, Tennessee, number double low. My big bro, Tony Delk. How What's you doing bro? today, bro? Man? How you doing? Doing all right, doing all right, man. Definitely, definitely thanks for coming on the show. Um, I appreciate you doing that. You know, you know, you like my big brother, and uh, just to and, yeah. When I when I got the text, when I got the text, I was like, man, you know, man, you know, I'm coming on, dude. You know, hey, I'm I'm gonna make time for my for my guy. You know, when 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 Bernard when Bernard hit us up, man, we gotta we gotta respond. And like I said, man, it's a privilege to come on. I know you're doing great things with your show, uh, getting so many different people on. But you know, most importantly, man, is that you know now you know you have a another career that you uh seem like you're dabbing in right now man so hey much congrats yeah i always wanted to get in broadcasting and um you know it was presented to me and great opportunity and uh jump right in somebody told me if someone gives you a great opportunity do it and you know work it out later so right yeah i am interviewing my big bro and um definitely uh privileged to have you on the show uh was always curious um you're originally from Brownsville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was being recruited by Kentucky, you know, the name I always heard was Tony Dell. Like he was always used, he was the poster boy pretty much when I right. got there. Right. And um, I always wondered, you know, who recruited you when you was in high school? I mean, you was a big McDonald's All American, Parade All American. Right. And I'm pretty sure a lot of schools was, uh, was was recruiting you and I always wondered who who recruited Tony like who did it come down to for you to make your decision uh, you know what it, it was it was I think as I you know teach and train youth basketball you know I tell the kids and tell the parents you know you gotta you have to find a style that's tailor-made for what you do and what you do well and I think that's how you can you know when you sign your letter of intent to come to University of Kentucky it was about a style so when I looked at the two different styles, Arkansas was a style that was someone, uh, coaching staff that I, I was very familiar with. I liked the way they got up and down the court. They played similar to how, you know, how Kentucky played. And also, so it would have been Arkansas with Nola Richardson, 40 Minutes of Hell, and I got to know those guys pretty well. Cortis Williamson, um, Scotty Thurman, um, <clears throat> and some of those guys they had been recruiting from Memphis. And then uh, University of Memphis, which turned out to be, you know, Penny Hardaway. Penny Hardaway and I became really good friends because I played with his first cousin, AAU, LaMarcus Golden, who ended up going to Tennessee. Um, so it, it came down to a few different schools, some mostly in the South, because I knew I wasn't going too far away from home. Um, so it was uh, Arkansas, uh, Memphis State at the time, which is University of Memphis now. Uh, Georgia Tech came into the picture really late. Uh, Bobby Crimmins got a chance to see me when I was playing in the AAU uh, tournament in Arkansas. And at that time, they only had one scholarship. And he kind of promised that scholarship to Martise Moore, uh, RIP, my guy, good friend of mine, who I uh, got a chance to um, not really play with, but, you know, we played against each other. And um, so I kind of knew that that scholarship was already gone. And when he came out of Kentucky, it, it was a decision on, you know, when I came to Midnight Madness, uh, Roger Rhodes, Rodney Dent, Jerry Prickett, Walter McCarty, we came in together. So I wasn't going to make my decision until, like, really the spring. And um, I was talking to Billy Dunham. He said, hey, coach, you know, he's, uh, you know, I don't know if there's going to be a scholarship in the spring. You know how this is, Barnum, man. I'm like, come on, with, with, <laughs> With, with, with you being a top player, you telling me you're not going to hold a scholarship <laughs> for me. So they kind of they kind of put the pressure on me, you know, to sign early because although I had a great time, I had one or two other visits that I want to take. So when I got back 
you know, I kind of made my decision. I was like, you know what, let me just call them and, and just get this out of the way. And it was so funny. I was having a conversation with my lady last night and we were talking about making that decision. I say, my mom, I don't know if your mom did the same thing, Wayne, but she made me, she made me call these coaches, man, and tell them I wasn't coming. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, hey, hey, I, I, I was almost terrified, man. I could call Coach Rich, Nolan Richardson and tell him I wasn't coming to Arkansas, man. You know, hey, we already running from him as it is. You already know, man. So it is so it, it came down to be, you know, a tougher decision because, like I said, we play similar styles. And, you know, when a coach and their staff start recruiting you, though, you know, you really you know, you have a connection with these guys. So it, it really was hard for me to pick up the phone and call Larry Finch, uh, another really good coach with at Memphis State at the time. Uh, he's he's passed. Um, Wade Houston was at Tennessee, Nola Richardson. So it, it really was tough to pick up the phone and call these guys because they had spent so much time and money and phone calls, man, you know, and I'm like, dang, man, I got to call these guys. But, you know, it, it, it really was out of respect. And years down the road, when I came in contact and I saw Coach Richardson, you know, those guys really, you know, they said, hey, man, we really respect you just picking up the phone and calling us instead of just being one of those guys that said, well, I've already signed a letter of intent and I'm not calling anyone. So, it's, you know, I think it's about being professional. And I had to learn that at an early age. But also my mom was like, hey, hey, they, they not, they're not recruiting me. They're recruiting you. So you better call them telling you're not coming. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That was definitely the right thing to do um, and the hard thing to do for sure at that age um, yeah. to tell somebody no who was, you know, very interested in you. And I I went through that, too. Um, and that was that was, you know, tough. Now, guys, you know, they go on the um, they can go on Twitter and say, thank for everybody who recruited me and this and that. And you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Hey, you know what? It, hey, that way. It, it's such an easy way. It's like, it's like the cop out, man. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, Text they message. Meet- you know, like I said, it's a message. I could text message someone, you know, and I, they never have to hear my voice. But I think, you know, going back, you know, 20, 30 some years ago, I mean, that's how we communicate. And I think that's the one reason why, you know, we're able to get on, you know, on a podcast and we can have we can elaborate and have have conversation is it's something that we grew up doing. And not to knock this generation. I mean, it is what it is. You know, each decade, you know, there's changes that take place, even with how even where the game is at right now to compared to how we played it in the 90s is, you know, you have to be prepared for changes. And, um, you know, I don't I don't really, you know, want to talk, excuse me, talk negative about this 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 generation. But, you know, it's a different generation that I have adapted to. And I know you have to do the same thing when you even, you know, going out and have a conversation with these people. Mm-hmm. So it's, I, I think it's important to understand, you know, where we at the times that we're in and then how do we how do we relate to them going back to when we played basketball, you know, and we still have a lot of knowledge. I know you have a lot of knowledge because you were one of the, you know, definitely one of the top five point guards ever played at University of Kentucky. Man, I don't think you get enough credit for, you know, what you did as far as like, you know, just being a leader on the court. And you came in, you know, as a young leader and you learned a lot from us, but, you know, you had leadership capability. And those are things that to me can't really be taught. You know, either you are a leader or you're not a leader. You know, I can't, I can't make someone something they don't want to be, but you came in and you demanded that respect early. So that was, that's one of the reasons why we, you know, when we played with you, it was like easy to play with a, with a point guard that knew his position, but also knew how to get everyone else involved. And although you was a big time scorer, you had to change your game. You know, even going back to my freshman year, you know, I don't, I don't know if you know the story, but I didn't play a lot. I mean, people just look at Tony Doug winning, you know, MOP and you know, us winning the championship. But I'm like, dude, my first probably five to ten games, Burner, man, I was like, dude, I'm up out of here, man. This ain't working out. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to even lie to you. <laughs> I can't lie to you, man. Right. And that was the, you know, that was pretty much the next question I was going to ask you. Um, you know, how tough was that transition? Because like you said, you know, myself coming in, you know, I remember, yeah, I was, I scored the ball a lot in high school and I know you scored. I think you've had like 72 points in one game, you know, before. And so how was that for you to go to Kentucky and say, okay, well, now this guy, won. he knew my game when he, I was in high school. Now he wants me to run the show. That's yeah. what I don't do. I score the ball. Right. Right. Uh, you know, you know, it, it, it's funny you said it too, 
too, because, um, you know, I was a ball dominant guy, you know, and, and like yourself, you know, that's what, you know, our coaches, our high school coaches expected out of. So when you're recruiting a Bernard, you're recruiting a, a, a Tony Delk, is that you're bringing us in to say, hey, guys, this is what you do well. Now, when you say make an adjustment, it's hard because we've done that for so long and it's hard for a, a teenager all of a sudden to say, hey, man, I want you to be a facilitator. I want you to do this. I want you to get these guys involved. And that was something that I wasn't accustomed to doing because my coach and my teammates relied on my scoring ability. So when I got there, you know, our offense ran through Jamal Mashburn, which was, you know, Jamal was definitely a great player. I'm not taking anything away from him. But I thought with myself, just like you, you know, we have our own ego. And I knew what I did well. And I was like, dude, now I have to take a back seat to someone. But I tell you what it did for me. It, it really taught me how to play without the ball. And it probably gave me an NBA career that I – that I didn't, see, didn't forecast seeing in the future. But at the time, you know, I'm thinking selfishly, man, I can't do what I've been doing well for the last you know, three or four years of my high school AAU career. And I really had to make adjust, uh, an adjustment and just learning how to move without the ball, set screens, use screens. And it really allowed me to see the game differently because even though you can be ball dominant, you still can be dominant scoring without the ball in your hand. That's really so it's, – it's so amazing. It, it amazes me that when I watch a player like James Harden, I'm like, dang, could I play with a guy like that? You know what I'm saying? That that dribble, 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 shoot, and, and, and really just create his own offense. But that's kind of how we played. But in order to win a championship, you have to be willing to give up some of that, you know, because you scored a lot of points in high school. I scored a lot of points in high school – and I would have given up at least 10 or 15 of those points, man, if I could have got a chance to win a, a state championship. You know, because at the end of the day, you're going to be looked at and how they look at us now, like how many championships did you win? You know, you got a chance to win two, which, you know, going to cement you past a lot of people. You know, they don't look at it and say, well, I'm like, dude, you know how hard it is to win one championship? Not less known, two. Two is even – two is difficult. I mean, how many coaches can we just sit back and say that are great coaches that only won one championship? You know, to win too, man, it speaks value for not only a coach, but also the players that can have either back to back or with yourself. You know, you went to, you know, dang, three final fours or four final fours, Bernard. Right. Right. Exactly. No, I I, I I feel you on that. And um, you know, when I got there, like like yourself, it was tough, you know, taking the back seat. Um, McDonald's all American and you know. People back home calling what's going on, you know, I can be playing this and that. And, you know, that's when you and you and Walter actually came into play. Like you were the guys I know myself and and also Ron. Ron was my roommate. We would always ask you guys questions and, you know, try to make it through that freshman year. But who was the guy for you? Like, because I know you got, every time coach got on me. <laughs> you know, ripping my head off. You always came over. My ear was like, don't worry about that. Just keep on playing, man. Forget, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Just yeah, keep yeah, balling. Yeah. But who was yeah, that yeah. guy for you? I tell you, helped me out was uh, was Dale Brown. Dale Brown was a senior. I was a freshman, you know, kind of you know, similar stories with you, know, with you and I. And, you know, you just need someone that, that you can lean on, man. Like, it's college is tough, um, especially – you know, although, you know, you're independent, you get a chance to, to, you know, to live your own life. You don't have a curfew anymore, although we did have curfew. But, um, you know, you get a chance to, to, to groom yourself and see who you really are as an individual. You get to grow as a, as a man. And when you're going through trials and tribulation, you know, you need someone you can lean on and definitely someone who's been in the same position that you've been in. So you and I basically shared the same position coming in as a McDonald's All-American and being, you know, scores. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, man, I need you to take, you know, take this, take, you know, take, take some of your ability away and, 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 and play a different game. And, and, it, and it was tough, you know. So Dale and I, you know, we sat back and, you know, we hung out. We spent time together. And we also, we played the same position. So, you know, it was even harder to, to share that information and knowledge with someone who was trying to get your playing time. But I respected him because every day we came to practice, man, I mean, we got at it every day. You know, he made me a much better player. He taught me the game. I learned how – that's who I really learned how to uh, play without the ball, just watching him, how crafty he was and setting up guys coming off pin downs and, you know, um, being able to curl and fade and 
you know, rubbing guys uh, completely off, setting great screens. And I was like, man, you know, that's that's who I want to be. So my freshman year kind of I was a student. I really was. I wasn't getting a lot of playing time, but, you know, I kind of went back and, you know, I had, had to revamp my game, to be honest with you, man. That's, that's that was the hardest thing. And like you said, you got these people calling you, your friends, man, why aren't you playing, you know, this, that. So you got the wrong people in your ear. And I think when you have positive people, because at the end of the day, no one knows the, you know, the publicity, you know, how hard it is to play at University of Kentucky. The press is constantly at you. Uh, you know, you have so many distractions, man. And then you got your friends telling you, man, you should go somewhere else. You should go play here. Man, why aren't you playing? Man, they don't like you. What's, what's up with your game? You know, so now you start thinking like, man, what's really going on here? <laughs> and also I had to grow up. You know, I had to grow, grow up and go have a conversation with Coach Patino. Man, what's your plan? Like, what, I mean, what, what are we going to do here? You know, and that, and that was a tough decision. But going back to my mom, she was like, hey, he recruited you. You know, go talk to him. He said, because he already told me, you're not coming back home. She said, you know, that, that's the last place you're coming. Like, you know, you make that decision. I didn't sign a letter of intent. That's somewhere where you want to go. I want you to go to somewhere totally different. So you pick that school. So to be honest with you, Bernard, I had to grow up, man. It was like, all right, you know, this, this is me. You know, you want to become a man? Here's a man decision. So I went and talked to him and, you know, we kind of aired some things out. But going back to your question was uh, Dale Brown really helped me, man. Like if that dude wasn't there, I can't even tell you where I would have been. Wow. And that's basically, you know, Kentucky basketball. That's that family, you know, them family yeah. ties looking out for each other. No and doubt. I definitely uh, appreciate you and, and and Walt and, you know, and even Jeff and Mark at times, you know, I, you know, had to stop them and ask them, you know, <laughs> what I need to do to get more playing time. Right. Um, but, you know, when Kentucky recruited me, um, they came in late. Um, and I'm backing up a little bit. They came in late. And, you know, I was impressed uh, by, you know, the recruitment um, because, you know, Delray Brooks uh -huh. uh, was pretty much. I think Coach O'Brien came and saw a high school right. game, but then Delray Brooks came and picked me up and we flew on a plane together to Kentucky. Wow. No other school has done this. Then after the visit, <laughs> he flew back with me and dropped me off at my front door That's big in the hood. So I was like. <laughs> I, you know, no, no other coach had done that, you know, right. me. And that just, you know, kind of blew me away, let yeah. alone I had a great visit. Um, yeah. And, you know, I had some good hosts and Derek Anderson and, and Roger Rhodes. But um, what, what was it that, you know, made you make that decision? Like what the coach, you know, what did he Man. do? I mean, he told me I was going to start. I didn't start. Yeah. But what did he <laughs> I mean, you know what, to be honest with you, Barna, hey, you know what, you, you told us both the same story. <laughs> you told both of us the same story, like, yeah, you're going to start, or if you're not going to start, you can get like 20 plus minutes, you know, and not to say that it had to be given to me, but I think when you're one of the top high school players, like, you know, you, you're used to starting, you used to, you know, not that guy coming off the bench, you know, the offense you know, ran through you coming out of uh, Massachusetts, and I think it's, it was the same thing with myself is, you know, you, you, I heard everything I wanted to hear. And, you know, Billy Donovan started recruiting me really early. And Billy, you know, now was either, he was sending me letters, on constantly on phone calls. He was driving from Lexington down to uh, Brownsville to watch me play. So he, he, he showed so much interest in me, man. And like you said, not to say that the other schools didn't, but they kind of went over the top in how they really wanted me. And when I made that trip, like I said, for Midnight Madness, you know, I, I left knowing I had a good feeling in my head that, you know what, I really want to come here, but I wanted to go visit some other schools. And when I had Wade Houston that was recruiting me, I'm like, man, in-state school, you know, it's, it was hard for me not to go and take a visit to my in-state school. Like, I think that was the hardest thing. And one thing that I, I would have changed about my recruiting process was that I would have paid the respect to at least going to my in-state school. Cause I already went to Memphis, which is 45 minutes from my home. But I went to Tennessee just because Coach Houston was there. And, I mean, an unbelievable guy. I would have had a chance to play with Allen Houston. But when I left Kentucky, I just felt like, man, this is where I want to be. And, I, and at the time, here's the thing, too, Bernard. I didn't really know the tradition, you know, like I knew it after I left or while I was there. I was like, man, you know, I'm so glad, you know, 20, 30 years later that I made the right choice. And you don't think when you're 18 years old, man, like, 
gosh, we're going to be a part of history. And I always, I, almost, I remember Coach telling us, he's like, man, if y'all win a championship, y'all going to be a part of history. And you're like 19, you're 20 years old thinking like, man, I don't care about no history, man. I'm trying to make it to the NBA. I'm trying to get paid doing this game. But it was the best decision for me to stay because a lot of times, you know this, when you when, when things become – when things are easy – is that you thinking life going to be like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, every it's, life going to be a cakewalk, man. I'm going to get everything I want. So the first time that we that you deal with adversity, you find out who you are. Are you going to succumb to like, you know, just, okay, hey, you know what, man? I'm just going to give up. Or are you going to fight harder? So what he did for both of us is that we developed even more mental toughness. We was already mentally tough when we got there. But I think we developed even more mental toughness. And that's what's... I would say missing in this generation as I train them. And I know you've been coaching yourself is that I miss us. I, I don't, I don't see the fight, you know, even though I want to leave, but you know, I, I'm still a fighter though. I'm like, listen, I'm leaving because I know I can play. You would have been leaving the same. They're saying it'd be different if we were that 12th man, you know, and we were like, okay, we're really not going to play. But when you come in, dude, we dominated our peers. So of course, I'm thinking like I'm watching all my peers play that I dominated. Them dudes getting playing time. Some of them dudes are starting. Of course, we're gonna feel some kind of way, and that's that's just how you know us being competitors. That's how we are. Right, right, exactly. No, I definitely feel you on that. Um, you think Kentucky is the best college team ever? You think that 1996? I think we were special. Um, if if not the best, you know, because I, I look back, you know, you like a historian like myself, you know, that, that UCLA team, as I kind of watch highlights of uh, that Kareem team, man, it, it would have been tough to really face them because of, you know, how – when I think about the GOAT, I think about, you know, the greatest player of all time. I had to put Kareem up there, man. Kareem dominated on every level, high school, college, and NBA. And we would have been able to – put like this, it would have been hard to stop him. Because, I mean, he couldn't be stopped anyway. But I think we could have – we had every other position that we could handle. You know what I'm saying? But that would have been a position that we would really have to figure out how to stop. You know, that's no, nobody could stop that Scott Hook. I don't care who it was. So, I look at us as not being the best, you know, definitely top three. I, I don't think anyone could have been able to withstand our style of play, you know, during that time. And, you know, it's, it's a different game now where you have uh, – you know, multiple guys that can dribble the ball and our press probably wouldn't have been as effective, but we still had really good players that we knew our roles, man. You know, I knew my role, you knew your role, and it's hard to get guys to buy in. Uh, but when I think about one of the, you know, the greatest team, I'm definitely going to put us in top three. I, I don't, you know, when they say top 10, I'm like, come on, dude, seriously. I mean, what we did and how we dominated teams and, the two teams we lost to, you know, both those teams made it to the Final Four. How many times can a team say, you know, the team that beat them, they got a chance to either revenge their loss or both of those teams were a finalist? So that speaks volume for how good we were, but also how good those teams were, you know, just to get to that game, you know, and that UMass team was really, really good, man, because they didn't – they were kind of like us in 95. They returned all their players. You know, and then we just added, like I said, we, you know, we brought in you, Ron, and then Derek became eligible. So we had such, so much talent. And I, I, I even look back, man, like, could you imagine, could you imagine coaching, you being Coach Patino with all that talent and saying, man, how am I going to keep all these guys happy? What would you have done differently? Would you have done anything differently? Or what would you, let's put your coaching hat on right now. So you have that team. And then you got to manage personalities. Well, we pressed so much. Um, so, you know, you had <laughs> no one really averaged over. And I think about it, no one, I think maybe you or Twan averaged the most minutes at like yeah. 24, 25. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was based on, you know, when we came to practice, you, I think the only spots that was locked was yours. <laughs> 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 and then at one point, um, I believe Walter, you know, he, he got locked in and everybody he else did. was like, Hey, come to practice. And if, if you ain't, you know, if, if you, if you're not working hard today, you know, he could, we were so talented. I felt like he could, you know, he could shuffle the lineup he and, could. and not lose yeah. 
as much, you know, from defense or offense. So, mm -hmm. you know, I thought, but I thought, you know, you, Mark, and Walter definitely was significant in keeping that team together because you always kept guys like myself, um, even Derek at times, and Tuan especially, just level-headed, you know, to play yeah. together, play with the team, and not so much think about self. Like one thing, you know, playing with you, I realized you was never a, you you played your role. You was never a selfish guy. Right. And you always you was always picking somebody up. Like you and Walt was always picking someone up. Walt's energy definitely um emotion his Excellent. emotional energy yeah. definitely got everybody excited. Twan's energy. And I just think we all complimented each other a lot. And coach, you know, shoot, he was just, I feel like he was just playing chess. Okay. <laughs> this game, we're going to play Wayne because he's, you know, he's quicker. He can guard this right. point guard. But for this right. game, we're going to play E because, you know, he shoots us from the outside a little better than Wayne. We need, he's going to get open shots and we need a guy out there that's going to knock it down. So, right. yeah, man, nine, nine NBA guys, you know, that was, uh, that was definitely a team that, I enjoy playing with, but I hated practice. <laughs> yeah, pra practice were tough, but you know, I, I think to your point too, like what you're saying about Coach P is that, you know, it, it's great to have options, man. You know what I'm saying? I think, you know, kids run from the challenges that that we were presented. You know what I'm saying? Because now it's like I want I want it to be easy. I don't want to go play with other good players or, you know, in, in college. I think and you know, as these guys are all friends now, you know, and, and we loved each other, man. We were. We really had a, a true brotherhood, you know, and that's that was the one thing I could say about that team was is that leadership, but also guys that, as you said, complimented each other, man. We really enjoyed fighting and playing for each other. Because once we we played so hard and competed at practice, man, that, you know, we always said is the game day was a day off. And it truly was a day off, you know, because of what we did all week, the the three and four hour practice film session. Um, just so much hard work that went behind this, man. I'm like, man, you don't even know, guys, how much effort and energy and, and sweat that we give in order to get playing time. Because you're right, we were fighting for basically 20 minutes. That was it, man. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get no 40 minutes because even from my sophomore, junior, junior season, I averaged between 33 and 35 minutes. And I remember going in and talking to Coach. He was like, hey, you know, you're, you're not going to be – playing as many minutes you know and i'm thinking like okay maybe like two or three but dude you talking about i dropped down to like 23 minutes so i lost like 12 minutes of playing time but here's the thing too wayne is that i averaged more points though which mm. is probably yeah. more remarkable if you look at my sophomore and junior season where i played more minutes i thought that i was more efficient i knew how to play the game so as you learn this game of basketball you know it should the game should slow down and I think what happened my senior year, you know, with me having so much, so many talented players around me, you know, I had to, I had to be more efficient of a shooter, you know, because I knew I wasn't gonna get that many shots, especially with, especially with Twan on the floor. Twan was out there, jacking, <laughs> big hit his hand, it was off, you know, it was gone. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, he he was a young, talented player, man. And, and you look at how the game is right now, and we have to go back and get Coach Patino a lot of credit because Coach Patino, to me, really started the small ball or the fours and fives that could put the ball on the floor to stretch four to stretch five. And he doesn't get a lot enough credit. They try to give all these other coaches credit for, oh, yeah, they got they got four or five guys that can handle the ball. I'm like, man, Coach P was Marcus shoot threes, Twan could shoot threes, Walter could shoot threes. You know, we had, we had bigs that could shoot threes. We had also bigs that – we're playmakers. You know, Wall can get the ball off the, off the rebound, push the ball full court. Same thing with, with Tuan. You know, uh, Pope was good enough where he can get it cross half court. You know, he probably could have got it all the way if he wanted to. But I think we just understood and we were just such a versatile team where you're right. Coach was playing chess. He could just he could move. He could move parts. He can move pieces around, man, and, and still get the same production. And that's hard to do. Just think about what we're saying and having nine guys that played in the NBA is that, man, that dude was able to take all of our talent, man, and mesh it and have us all be satisfied. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's tough to satisfy those egos, man. But, you know, we, we really – I thought once we got on that long winning streak, I thought we saw what he saw in us too. He saw something special. And that's when we start realizing, like, man, you know, when you're going on the road and beat teams by 20, 30 points and – 
seeing the home crowd leave, you know, with 10, 15 minutes to go in the game, I'm like, man, you know, I ain't never seen that since I've been here. But that's what we were doing. We were demolishing teams. And, you know, when you get that, that kind of uh, talent together and that talent is willing to sacrifice for each other, you got something special. Right. And, um, you know, just I was just thinking about, you know, um, it just flashed back to my head how we had to be on the bus so early to uh, before, <laughs> before oh, the game. And uh, I just remember just being so nervous to be late because coach will leave you. Like, who is the person? <laughs> Man, coach, coach got got the before like, who'd, you got you there? See, who'd you see get left the worst? Like, I mean. <laughs> Man, he left. Uh... <laughs> So but here's a quick story right here. So we're, we're playing, I think we're in the Elite Eight game, man. And so everybody's on the bus except Roderick and Rodney Dent. So the, everybody's on the bus. And I mean, so Rod, Roger, so back, I'm, I'm going to take you back. So the, the listeners, think about this. We had headphones, <laughs> some real headphones, a CD player, or maybe even walk right, out right. of This so, man, this man. <laughs> so Roderick and Rodney are walking toward, like, they're coming toward, like, we see them. Like out the window, coming walking toward the bus, right? So I'm like, okay, coach, tell the bus driver pull off. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, die laughing, we're like, dude, you get ready to leave them. I'm like, we're looking like he was like, pull off. So you need to see. So you know how Rod is. Rod is looking like, and, and Moon is like, dude, they're really leaving us. So we actually left them, dudes, man. So we left them, and of course, you know how the fans travel, man. They hopped in the ride with some fans. And rode to the arena with the fans. Like he really, he really waited for them to walk through the door to leave them. And that's just how Coach P was. You know, to us, it was always being Wildcat time, which is 15 minutes early. You know, so and that's something we believe, and I still preach that now to my kids is that I'd rather be early than to be late. You know, early means that even though you're there, you're you're there ready, prep, prepped and ready to start playing the game like you you. That means your head is into the game. But when you come, like, right, if, if practice at 10 o'clock, you come at right at, let's say, 9.59 or even at 10, you just get in there, you're not ready to practice. And also, if it's a game time, man, I, I need my guys locked in. So we, we kind of knew what our job was. But it started with the leadership of, of Coach Patino. And you got a chance to work with him, uh, you know, at the University of Louisville. And I'm sure, you know, a lot didn't change with Coach Patino. He probably still expected the same out of his coaching staff just as well as his players. So – he wasn't a coach that demanded something that he wasn't willing to do with self and sacrifice. And I think that's when you really get your coaching staff and your players to buy in when you're willing to do the same thing that they're willing to do. And, and that's respect. And I think as I teach my kids, I say, I'm not going to tell you something that either I haven't done or I'm not willing to do. Right. And that was, that's definitely something um, I had to adjust to when I got there. It was, you know, it was, it was different, but it definitely it stuck with, it's still with me to this day. And yeah. uh, definitely thank coach for the, doing that. He, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. He still has that same accountability and, you know, <laughs> it's the way you should be anyway, as a, as a professional. Yeah. Yeah. He, but like, I think, he, and the thing is too, Brian, I think he taught us, he taught us so much. Like he really was preparing us for life, man. And we probably didn't see it because we were young guys and, you know, having a different relationship, um, with different coaches over the years for myself, man, I, I always have to reflect back to what coach Patino did for you, myself, and so many others, man. And, and just teaching us how to be men, responsible men, uh, taking care of our business. And, you know, no, we're not perfect. You know, we, you know, you made mistakes. I made mistakes. We all make mistakes. He's made mistakes, but I, I think he saw so much in us and, you know, he was a, a father figure away from home. And someone that we didn't want to disappoint. It's kind of like with your mom, man. As, as a son, uh, you know, you don't want to disappoint your mom. I mean, that, and that's just how he made us feel. We didn't want to let him down. I thought he gave and sacrificed so much because he gave us. You got to think back to even you got a chance to work with him at University of Louisville. Is that you know he sacrificed a lot of his time with his family and made us his family. You know, and that's a hard thing to do, man. I can't imagine me growing up and not having my mom and dad, you know, in the house and seeing them every day, man. But, you know, he did that away from his kid because he had at that time, he had young kids. You know, he didn't have no, he didn't have grown kids. Like, you know, when you was on his staff, he had like young kids, like babies. And, you know, I'm like, wow, man, this dude must really, really love basketball because 
I love my parents, and I know, man, I couldn't imagine not seeing my mom and dad because I saw them every day. They were older, and, you know, they were retired, but, you know, he sacrificed a lot of his time in order to make us who we were today, and, you know, we all love him and and uh, respect everything he done that he did for us during those times, and, um, you know, you got to you got to have good people and good mentors. And he was a great mentor for so many men. Yeah, definitely. Definitely was, uh, definitely learned a whole lot from coach. Um, definitely wouldn't trade that for anything. And oh, shoot, the decision I made playing for him, but, uh, this backing up a little bit, going back to the midnight madness situation. So last year, I think that was the last time we actually saw each other. Um, yeah. we went to the big blue madness and, um, you know, it was just so different. Like, I remember when we was playing, you know, we came down the stairs and, you know, yeah. Memorial Coliseum, and now they got the blue carpet and, you know, the paparazzi, and, <laughs> you know. Like, I always just felt like for a freshman, even in Memorial, that was, like, huge for me. I was, you know, I was scared, scared to death. <laughs> but as far as the blue carpet, like, how – what do you think of that? Like, for a freshman coming in and just seeing all of that hype, I mean, how – that just seems like a lot of pressure for a freshman. It, it is, you know, and I, I think with us, you know, it, the game actually took place at midnight. So it was like you had that <laughs> a two hour practice. Right. There, like you wait, you know what? It's, right. it's, you know, it, it, it was a restless day leading up to midnight madness. Cause you know, you had to practice and perform in front of fans. And then like the next day we, we had a real practice. You no, know? it wasn't like we played at midnight and, and we had the next day off. Like the next day was, the real practice. But <laughs> I, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of like going back to this generation, you know, where it is social media. It is about, you know, taking pictures and tweeting and getting these followers. And it's, it's different. It's a lot of pressure. But, you know, whenever you sign a letter of intent to come to Kentucky, I mean, you know, for most of those guys, you know, when you get there, you know, you're on a small microscope and you are the only and the biggest show in town. So, if that's a, if that's something that you're not familiar with, not used to, you know, it will eat you up. You know, it, it will consume and take a lot of your time and you will easily get distracted. But I think when you have, you know, good leadership and that's where I give Coach Cal a lot of credit. I got a chance to work on Coach Cal staff for two years and just to manage the egos of players like you, myself coming in as, as highly talented, talented freshmen is that them dudes have gotten everything they wanted. Everybody know who they are. So it's not like you're going to Kentucky. Most of these guys, they already have their brand. You know, they already have a name for themselves. You know, even before they get to the University of Kentucky, like you're going to know who B.J. Boston is, you know, years before. As soon as he signed 11 and 10, it's like, oh, B.J. Boston. We already know who these guys are. You know, like at a, a Imani Bates, you know who the top players are because they're so visible with either having ESPN games, or they have a social media following and they have highlight, you know, they have their own highlight tape. Can you imagine having your own a, a, a know, right? highlight tape? Come on, <laughs> man. You know, it, it was it was crazy when I first got on Coach Kyle's staff. I didn't really know who John Wall was. So I'm like, man, who's this who this dude, John Wall? Right, man, right. Listen, <laughs> I went back and watched his highlight tape. I was like, oh, this dude's the real deal. You know what I'm <laughs> but, but that's just how it was. They had it wasn't even a game. So it was a highlight film of just all his spectacular plays and that's what this generation is accustomed to seeing you know we have to really go back and watch game tape man and really learn our opponent and you know really just you know have a, a a thorough scouting report on these guys and now these guys you know they they can take a shortcut to something that would take us hours to do and like and I'm, I'm not i'm not hating on this generation it's, it's the time the times have changed and we have to adapt to it because as you were coaching, I was coaching is I couldn't coach the kids the way coach Patino coached us. Totally different. Cause you lose those kids, you know, because those kids are so used to getting everything they want that, you know, it's kind of like once they start seeing resistance and you, you have to show them more love than coach Patino showed us. I think coach loved us after the, after the, <laughs> After uh, we were done playing, but I'm not sure he loved it while we was playing, man. He was just, it was just so hard, but you know, he, he loved it, but he loved us in his own way. And it was so funny when I left, man, like we actually sat down and we broke bread. I'm like, coach is pretty cool, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We're doing them four years, Barna. Woo. Between the yeah. lines. <laughs> Between them lines. <laughs>
<laughs> That's a different you already person. know, dude. I'm like, man, this dude hates. I, I, I remember, that, I remember that very first day of practice, man, when he kicked me and Rod out of practice. <laughs> <He was> like, <laughs> so, dude, yeah, you, know, you get we, kicked out at least. Dude, time. listen, man. As fresh, Vernon, <laughs> we was going hard, man. We went hard, like we must have practiced. Right, we, our first individual instruction. So we, we were in individual instruction, and it was just the two of us and Coach Patino. You know how when Coach when Coach P walked down, down upstairs. <laughs> you know, right, so so for those listen, they don't know, man. But when Coach came out and stepped, I mean, it, it was it, it, your your intensity level went from <laughs> ninety five to about one hundred and twenty, and he took it up to about one hundred and twenty. So we were going through individual instruction. We were probably about thirty minutes in, man. We had like another fifteen minutes. And I tell you, dude, I had never been that exhausted in my life. Like, we, he told us going through all our shooting ball handling, he was like, hey, y'all got to play one-on-one. Dude, we just followed each other. We laid on each other. We were just – we was exhausted. He was like, y'all get the – out of practice, y'all pamper first, man. I don't want to see y'all until this afternoon practice. It's going to be the worst practice of y'all life. I'm like, dude, we got to practice after this? Right. We both looked at each other. We was like, man, did we make the right <laughs> But you know, but also you know this, man. You really got to get used to playing at that level of intensity mm -hmm. in order to, to kind of like you know, it, it teaches you how the game is going to be if you ever make it to the next level. Like you got to bring it every day. Like you can't, you don't have the luxury of taking time off. And then he just taught us so much about the game, man. Like you know, even I, I wanted to leave early. I wanted to leave as a junior, and. I really had contemplated leaving. You know, I was like, man, you know, not to say I hated school, but I felt like I was ready for that next level. And, uh, you know, we had a great conversation, you know, before I got a chance to uh, come back for the 95, 96 season, which was a, a great decision by me. But, you know, I felt like there was unfinished business. When we lost to uh, North Carolina in 95, I just felt like, man, you know, we have a team here that should be able to win a championship. And when we added yourself and run and, I knew D.A. was going to be eligible. I was like, man, you know, we got a chance. But, you know, th that was a decision where I had also promised my mom that I was going to get my degree. I was only about maybe four classes away from getting my degree. I was like, man, do I stay? Do I leave? And, um, you know, I thought I made the right decision. No, you definitely did. I, I remember riding with my coach, my high school coach. I think I was uh, about to make my decision to play at Kentucky and he was reading in the Sports Illustrated and I think it was right right after your junior year and it was like Tony Delk is a lock in the NBA and I, I just thought that was like kind right. of cool because I was like this dude's going to the NBA yeah so, but you stayed which was uh and I figured that's probably the reason why you stayed because you know the way that, the way that the year ended to North Carolina I think yeah, y'all was... beat them it was so, tough man it didn't work out you know, and, and you've been in those situations where they like to say it's been like like it's a bitter loss, man. A, a, sometimes a bitter loss stays with you a lot longer when you know you're the better team. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you beat us and we gave, like I said, and it came down to a, a last possession, last second shot, you know what? I'm fine with it. You know, I, I, and if, if that had happened, I think I would have been okay with leaving. But I just felt like what happened during the game took away from what we were able to do because we had pretty much beaten that. And, and that year was just as spectacular as our 95, 96. You know, we didn't put that many, many uh, games of, of winning. You know, we didn't win that. We didn't have a longer winning streak like we did in 95, 96. But I just thought we were just so, I mean, we was, we was clicking on all cylinders and we just had that one bad game. And it really was when Walter got a technical foul and Dre got a technical foul and Walter got his second foul. And that took him out the first half. And he was having a really good game. And he was a matchup problem for, uh, for North Carolina. And they just changed the whole momentum of the game. And, and we never – we just – and we basically trailed the whole time. And uh, we didn't play particularly well. So I was like, man, we're right here. And then to sit back and watch. Because I think that was one of the – one of the, the one final fours I just couldn't watch. Because we had beaten Arkansas in the uh, SC championship game. And I forgot the other two teams, but, oh, here's something else, too. So we go out to UCLA. We lose to them by one point. So they end up winning the 95 National Championships. So the first ever John Wooden Classic, we lose to them by one point. And we lost to them. It was my by far one of my worst games in college basketball. I actually fouled out of that game. So I was like, man, we going out here. So we had to go out there and play them on their home court. And – 
there was an inbound play. Ball came in. It was a phantom foul by this guy Henderson that went to the went went to the basket. Walter blocked the shot. He goes to the line. He makes two free throws, and we lose by one point. So you have UCLA, who we lose by one. We had already beaten Arkansas, and I don't, I forget that four team, and uh, so I knew we were supposed to be one of those four teams in the Final Four. So that was of all the years I played, that was the toughest Final Four game to watch and see teams that I knew we were just as good as, and we should have been one of those four teams, you know, so, we, you know, it, but things happen for a reason, you know, you live and learn. Right. And I think that made myself, I was hungry when I came back, I was like, man, you know, now, now it's our turn. And like I said, you guys took it from there, you know, even y'all making it to the game in 97, which I was like, I'm sent back in Charlotte, you know, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a North Carolinian. Now I'm like, man, my dude about to bring us back to back championship. You know, we about to do this thing. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, it, it was a tough game because how you guys played and then just not having Derek. I think Derek, Derek was a difference maker. Even not having Derek, you guys still were in position to win that game. You know, it came down to, as I tell kids, I say, you know, free throws and having good decision makers on the court. I say, when you have a, a really good team, they execute and they know what it takes to win. But, as you guys, you know, went through adversity in 97, you know, it made y'all a much better team in 98 when y'all came back. Cause y'all had, cause y'all, y'all was trailing big against that Duke team, you know, and I'm not, and I'm just like, man, you know, you look at, at that NCAA tournament game and you don't know when the team go up double digits that man, it's probably over with, you know, but just the resilience and the fight that you had and how you kept the troops together, man, and how you was just, you were a leader, you know, they, they needed leadership at that time. And I think that's when you and so many other guys stepped up and was like, man, hey, dude, we've done this before. We've seen this before. Yeah, it's like in a, you, definitely in a tournament, I always felt like, you know, you had to play loose. It was kind of like, you know, the vice scripts kind of came off and it was yeah. like, you know, everybody knows what everybody's doing. You know, everybody, you know, everybody got the scouting report. Now it's like your skill and your talent versus, you know, that person that's guarding you or you're defending mm -hmm. and, you know, you perform. It's almost, it's, it's weird because it, you feel so much more looser. I always felt more looser, you know, in those uh, tournament games than I was in the, um, you know, the regular season games. But moving forward, you know, I'm not going to hold you too much longer, but, um, you know, after Kentucky, um, won a national championship, got drafted by Charlotte and, um, you know, ended up going on a successful career, a long career in the NBA. Um, I, you know, definitely enjoyed watching you, especially when you played in Boston, <laughs> but, but I realized you weren't, you weren't a lot in those places. You weren't there for a long time. And yeah. I always wondered like, you know, how, like how many, like how was you able to develop race relationship with guys you've only known, you know, for a couple of years and, you know, you know, being with guy as opposed to being with, you know, at know. Kentucky for four years, like yeah. who was your, who's your guys, you know, from those teams? It, it was, um, you know, it, to be honest with you, Bernie, it was tough, man. I can't even lie to, you, you know, going from, and it wasn't like, you know, I was a bad player. You know, I, everywhere I went, I played, I, I did, you know, I knew my role. I scored, uh, was a good teammate. I had a contract that was easy to move. And I think, you know, one of the teams I really enjoyed playing with was Sacramento Kings, which kind of reminded me of my Kentucky team, you know, with having fours and fives that could dribble leadership, uh, being able to play my game because Rick Adelman, who was a coach, uh, uh, with the Sacramento Kings, he allowed me to play. He just said, hey, hey, go out there and get buckets. And when that season ended, um, I got a chance to go to Phoenix, you know, and Scott Skiles was my coach there. And, you know, he called me buckets. He was like, dude, listen, I want you to go do what you do. He said, play defense and you got you know, and you can score. He said just – so when I left Sacramento, I wanted to go play with Jason Kidd because I wanted him – I wanted to have a point guard and then allow me to be able to be the shooting guard and then I knew I could just play my game. And I had to worry about the responsibility of being a point guard. So that was the best situation for me until Jay got traded. When Jay got traded in New Jersey, then I was like, man, you know, now I got to start all over again. And by the luck of luck of the draw, I got traded to Boston. And Coach O'Brien was the coach there. And he knew my game. You know, so I definitely played well where guys knew what I could do well. You know, instead of trying to point me and make me something – 
that's one of the reasons why I love where the game is at today because I would have been a versatile player, you know, playing the one and two. But it wouldn't have been about, oh, he's 6'1 and he can't do this, you know, because there were certain places where you had to be a certain size. We've seen how the game is right now. You might see three guys 6'1, you know, or, 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 or less or probably smaller than that. You know, you look at Toronto, you know, they can put two small guards out there and still have a 6'3, six, 6'4 six, guard. And the coach trusts in their ability. So you have to have a coach to understand your game and know what you do well and allow you to do that because that's when you're going to get the most out of a player, you know, even with yourself, is that now you let me rock. Dude, I'm a, I know what I can do. I've been doing this for many, many years. and But to get traded that many times, I'm just like, man, I'm, you know, just kind of setting up shop. And, you know, I never really got down because I spent so much time working on my game. I knew exactly who I was. But, you know, to, to have success, it takes you being with the organization for a number of years because now you learn the system. And I think that's what made us so such a good team at Kentucky. We stayed there for, you know, for myself four years, you know, and, and you learn your play, you learn your teammates, you learn your city. It's a better environment and you know what's expected out of you each and every year. And it's hard when I got traded from Charlotte to go to state, which was a bad team at the time. And then I became a free agent. I signed with Sacramento. I signed a two year them and, I opted out to go to Phoenix. I'm, I'm thinking six-year deal, man, I'm going to be there for six years. Dude, two years in, I get traded to Boston, to the coldest city, to the coldest place. <laughs> hey, your home state, the coldest place I ever played. Now, I got traded uh, from Phoenix to Boston in February. So about a week later, I don't know, you probably remember this storm. So a week later, we on a West Coast swing, and Boston get 26 inches of snow, dude. I had never in my life heard of that, that many <laughs> inches of snow. I'm like, it can really snow that much. <laughs> and so, but but at the time, we just happened to be out west. So when I got traded from from Phoenix to Boston, I had been I was in California for three years. I was in Phoenix for like about a year and a half. I had no warm clothes. So when that trade took place, you know, you have like 48 hours to report to that team, and I'm thinking, okay. I have no, I have no Tims, you know, hey, I, hey, I became a huge Tim fan too. I'm like, I need me some Timberlands. I had no Timberlands. I might've had one coat. Wow. So I get to the hotel, dude, this is like a negative 11. I'm like, <laughs> this can't be real. Like it can't, like it really cannot be this cold here. And so <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, like I have to stay here this long. So from February until our season ended, I stayed in the hotel the whole time. Like I didn't even, it was so cold. I didn't even go look for uh, an apartment or a house. I was like, I'm staying there. So when that season ended, so we ended up going to East Conference Finals that year. We lost to uh, lost to New Jersey. And I had my stuff packed a month before our season ended. So all if you came in, you had to walk in my hotel room. I had my – everything was packed. So whenever that, whenever that last game was, whether we went to the finals or East Conference Finals, that game ended, I flew out the very next day. Like, the game ended. I had my stuff already packed. I flew to Phoenix. When I left Boston, it was 55 degrees. When I arrived in Phoenix, it was 113. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, wow. quite, quite a different than in, in, in Mass and Arizona, man. So, that's one of the reasons why, to this day, I, don't, I do not like cold weather. I hate cold weather. No, I don't blame you. That's why I'm in Kentucky now. <laughs> It's still, you know, it's still we're still getting seventy degrees. Hey, hey, right hey Kentucky looking cold for me too. I ain't gonna lie to you, but I'm like, like <laughs> no, I'm, I'm more. Hey, I'm, I'm more of a Georgia, Florida, <laughs> California, Arizona dude. <laughs> but hey, but like I said, you gotta know your body, man. Like I, I right. knew my body didn't. You know, my my body wasn't meant to be in cold weather. You know, and so, you know what I found out later, which I did know was, I had the sickle cell trait, and uh, the mm-hmm. reason why I was doing a lot of cramping back then was, you know, my body was not getting enough oxygen. And I didn't really find that out until my, I want to say my second, first or second season in the NBA when they tested, when I went through some tests, and they was like, hey, you have, you have sickle cell trait. And I didn't, I wasn't very, very I wasn't familiar with it at all then. And mm. so now it goes back to when I was cramping a lot, a lot of that was from my sickle cell. You know, my blood was sickling and I didn't even know it. And I don't think the doctors knew that. So even going back to, the testing that that is being done at university now is 
probably about eight to ten years ago, some guys, I think a couple of players, football players, died from uh, having sickle cell trait. And mm-hmm. they started taking it a lot more serious. And, and we didn't mm-hmm. we just didn't know back then, you know, the reason why I was doing all that cramping. Oh, wow. So you found out that way. Yeah. You found mm-hmm. out that way. Wow, yeah. That's interesting. And I know you started the foundation. Yeah, for my um, daughter. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Um, so after the NBA, you know, I, I didn't even know. Um, you know, I just recently saw it. Um, but I vaguely remember you went overseas for how many, for about two years or I so? I only did maybe. one year, Wayne. I, I only did that one year in past night. I was in Greece. And, um, you know, it was it was different, man. You know, like going over there and, and trying to play a game that I wasn't accustomed to playing. I think I'd have been, I'd have been great in, in Greece or even overseas if I hadn't left the NBA so late. And I was kind of there because – I was mad at my, not really upset. My, my agent, we had a player option. So when I opted out of my contract, we were supposed to be going back to Detroit at the time. So, excuse me, they ended up signing someone else and it took my, my slot away. So I'm kind of waiting to see what other teams were going to want my you know, services. And I had, a, I had a guaranteed deal on the table in Greece and we just took that deal. You know, but if if I were to go back, I never would opt out of my deal because I still felt like at that time, that would be my 11th year and maybe one more. I probably should have played at least 12 or 13 years and then took it overseas money. And uh, I just thought we made a, a bad, bad decision opting out of a contract when you have a guarantee. Cause you, you don't have a guarantee to go and, and go overseas. You know, that makes no sense because I had never lived overseas. So it, it was going to be a transit for myself anyway. So it was. When I went, I just knew I wasn't going to probably play anymore. I was like, dude, it's, it's about that time for me to retire. Because, you know, if I got to go through this at the end of my career, you know yeah. what? Let me get into coaching. Yeah, that was a change, huh, that going over. I've journeyed Ooh. overseas. I've never been to Greece, but. Greece um, is beautiful, though. The country is beautiful. I, yeah. I mean, I had a great time there. It was just a, put like this, I, I got a Coach Patino at the end of my career. And I was like, <laughs> uh. <laughs> the end of your career. <laughs> So, 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 Bernard, think about this. Think about at the end of, end of your career, man, you come into the casino. <laughs> nothing, they, nothing against those people, man. No, I was like, dude. Hey, that's funny you say that because <laughs> I had a, I had a Coach Patino in Italy. I, I was like, you got to be kidding me. And that was like one of my second jobs. <laughs> I'm good on – hey, Bernard, I'm good on that one, man. Hey, I, lo- I love – Coach P, I love you to death, man. But uh, – <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to see a Coach P at the end of my career. <laughs> <laughs> coach make you hey, Coach fly the fire under you for sure. Man, for real. Um, for so, yeah, that was an experience. And I thought I was like, well, T went overseas in just one year. But, um, no, I always wonder what that was like for you because I was over there and it was totally different. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was this – it was almost – I never knew how to how – to, the luxury NBA guys got treated like yourself, right. the draft picks, but you know, it definitely was like almost like going back to college in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> it was, man. I, I can't even lie to you, man. Like, like that, that was, that was a feeling that I got that I guess that it just left, it left a bad taste in my mouth, man. I was like, dude, I felt like I had, I was starting all over again, you know, just, and, and I just, I, I had come too far to kind of like, change my game you know what i'm saying like if you, when you've done something you've been successful at it for 10 years and, and 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 i'm and plus you know i'm a grown man now i'm not an 18 19 year old kid anymore so you know you're not gonna talk to me a certain way i'm gonna come in i'm, I'm still gonna be a professor i'm gonna do my job but you know it was kind of like i felt like i was a, a 18 19 year old kid starting all over again and i was like dude i just can't I'm, i've come too far to go through that right now you know so you so easily gotta you gotta make a decision you know like i said i was like hey um, you know, it's probably time for me to transition to something else totally different. And that's what I did. You know, I got a chance to coach a little bit in Puerto Rico. Uh, and then before I knew it, I hopped on Coach Cal's staff for two years. And then I went out to New Mexico State and, you know, got a really good feel for just, you know, what I really want to do. But when I but when I eventually came back to Atlanta, I started I wanted to start building my own basketball academy, um, you know, youth basketball. And that's what I've been doing, and I really have enjoyed it. You know, I, I've had 
over the fall um, for the fall league this year, I had seven teams that I had to kind of manage and I coached a couple of the teams, but I kind of find this something that I enjoy. I don't know for how long, but you know, when you're doing something, you're trying to do what you've been doing your whole life. And it's been basketball, you know, commentating. I, I enjoy doing that as well. That's something else that I've gotten a chance to transition in, you know, with SEC Network, still do NBA TV, uh, have a couple podcasts that I do. Um, but, you know, it's still basketball. So, you know, as long as it's basketball, I think it makes me happy, man. Like, that's my happy place. <laughs> what's, what's up with the wine? Twan, Twan was trying to get on. Oh, you know what? Um, Lorenzo, we, 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 we doing a, I uh, did a, uh, we getting ready to do something big here in December. With you the didn't wine. give me a bottle yet, bro. I, I, got I, you, I made a sample or something. Hey, 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 what you do, man. You text me your address. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you some wine. The, the wine is called Lorenzo, which is my middle name and double zeros. You can find it at TonyDelk.com or wildsidewinery.com but you know it, it was it was presented to me when i was coaching at new mexico state about this wine you know and, and I, like i said i don't drink but it was more about an opportunity and i knew if i was going to do something with wine it would have to be somewhere where i'm able to drive to or somewhere where i can learn the business and i just got a chance you know when it started two years ago you know to really get with some really good people at wildside winery and even what we're doing now, you know, for the next up until December, 15 percent of my profits, you know, proceeds would be going to Kentucky Children's Hospital. So we're still trying to work out a deal with them, um, with the wild, with the winery, you know, to make sure our sales are up. So, you know, we can help Kentucky Children's Hospital, all those uh, frontline workers, you know, so it's it's where. You know, you want to be in a position where you can help others. And I think, you know, you know me well, man. I'm always, you know, caring and sharing and, and doing what's right and making sure that those who uh, who don't have, if I'm in a position to help, that's what I'm going to do. You know, so my wine has done, you know, extremely, you know, been extremely something, something that I extremely enjoy, you know. And as much as I love basketball, I'm kind of spending more time with my wine, you know, um, probably the last couple of weeks, man, to be honest with you, because I'm really trying to, get out there and promote it. But, um, you know, basketball is always going to be, you know, the my at, at the forefront of whatever I'm doing. And, you know, we just got to keep that going. Right. Yeah. No, I, I um, had my experience with wine. I was playing in Australia and I had a good friend of mine, good teammate, great teammate, guy by the name of Rob Rose. And he just, and he had like a big, you know, refrigerator of wine. And I mean, expensive wine. <laughs> it was like 300 a bottle. And I just thought that was crazy. But when I drank it, it was, you know, it was like, wow. And that's when I, you know, had my taste. So I had to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, yeah, yeah, I saw man. you got into it. Very proud of you of doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah man. It's, like I said, it's really creating some, some different ventures in life, man. You know, using using basketball as our platform and just with our connections, man, Kentucky has done so much for, for you, myself, you know, just from our relationship and, you know, having won a championship, but just the tradition allows us to be able to go out and, and know, and, and people respect what we've done, but also, man, it's like Kentucky is like the Mecca of college basketball. Like it doesn't get any better to me. It doesn't get any better. We, we, you know, we had the best fan base that I've ever seen. I really didn't appreciate our fan base. Until I got to some of these NBA teams, I was like, man, they don't support us like Kentucky. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, if we went to think about this, if we, if we right. travel to the moon, <laughs> we would have some fans, man. Seriously. Hey, we I was mean, in Alaska. Remember, we was in Alaska. <laughs> man, yeah. Hey, they coming. Yeah, or, or even like, even when we actually, went over. I think you, was, you wasn't there that year. You, you actually had just left. But yeah. Man, when I saw all those fans in Alaska, I'm thinking, oh, this is Alaska, bro. <laughs> Man, you know, and you know, so the when whole I thought about Austin being cold, like, okay, so when I was coaching at New Mexico State, we played in in the Great Alaska Shootout, like, like you know, what you, what you guys did in 97. And the whole time, dude, I never saw the pavement. It was snow for six days. I was like, man, how do people live? You know, back, <laughs> back to my story about Massachusetts, I'm like, man, how do people live here? Like, this right. is beyond cold. Like I don't, I don't want. Only time I want to see snow is on TV, and I'm not lying. Like I'm, I'm for real. I'm that dude. Like I do not like snow. Period. 
There ain't nothing pretty about it unless I'm watching it on TV. Yeah, I think Alan Edwards was the first one. When the first time he saw snow was in in Kentucky. <laughs> they said Al was just standing there, just touching the snow. He had never saw snow before because he's from <laughs> Miami. It never snow in Miami at the time. Oh no, definitely not, man. Right. Definitely not. Uh, another place I can live, man, is is, is Miami. <laughs> if it, but like, it's, I don't want to see snow in my backyard. I don't want to see snow. I don't want to see snow coming down. Period. That's that is how I am. I, I want to live my life without snow. Right. Well, I ain't gonna hold you too much longer, bro. But I'm gonna leave you with this because it stands out every time I see you. It was my very. <laughs> My very first individual instruction was me, you, and Chef. I don't even know if you remember, but it was my very first, and it was at six thirty a.m. with with Coach. Yeah, <laughs> and they always did Coach, Coach Brooks, Coach O'Brien, Coach Ben. It was the first one. We and we're walking across the street, and I'm like, "T, what all these tents doing out here? Like, what are you?" <laughs> Where these tents come from? And you was like, hey, they're waiting on Midnight Madness because it was the same night of Midnight Madness. Right. So we walk in the individual instruction and it's 90 minutes on the clock. Then <laughs> <Remember> we had <laughs> Woo. Coach crammed it all in. He was like, we're going to get this working. We got this much time left for the week. We're going to get it all in, right? So we working on positive press. And I remember this, I'm like thinking like, wow, we we working on process of press. This is cool, right? So we working on trapping and Shep is the ball handler. And I think you, you're you like guarding them to get it in. And then E is the trap guy. I'm like the other guy on the far end waiting for when, if he beat y'all, then he got to beat me to the basket and score. So... <laughs> I think you know Chef only had one right hand, right? Hey, hey, so hey, hey. You you have forced him in a speed dribble. He's driving on the sideline. He's standing right there. Chef just boomed. <laughs> hey, he knocked E straight over. And Coach looked at Chef and said, you know the face he made. Did you not see the guy standing right <laughs> Hey, that individual, right? That was like one of the first plays, man. I'm thinking to myself, like you said, man, what, what did I get myself into? Hey, man. Was, okay. Hey, he was on one then. But I tell you what, <laughs> after that, end of, like, after the 60 minutes went off, that last 30 minutes, all we had to do was shoot free throws. I was like, man, thank you, God. <laughs> hey, man. Well, you know what? It, it, it makes you think about a God when you look up there and you still got time <laughs> and you're like, man, I have nothing else left because I'm, I'm going to take you back to a story right before we uh, go off here is that Herb Sendek dude had me, he had me, I had to make six layups in like 30 seconds full court at the end of individual instruction. Yes, dude. So you know how tired we are at the end. Right. I, I don't know where he got this idea of like, dude, you can make six layups in 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm like, man, are you, <laughs> you think I'm Deion Sanders? You think I'm who? <laughs> man who you think i am right now like dude it was i'm talking about at the very end so you know what hard individual instruction is he was like hey he put 30 seconds up there. i'm like okay i'm thinking I'm about to do like a 30 second suicide he's like no you're gonna make six layups i looked at him like dude that's impossible so of course you know i'm i gotta try because it's up on the clock man i'm i couldn't wait for that when that thing hit when that buzzer hit dude I think I might have I might have skipped class that day. I was <laughs> I went back to the room and fell asleep. I was like, man, he took everything out of me. I'm like, it made no sense. But that's just those were kind of challenges that we were presented at Kentucky that, like I said earlier, it gave us mental toughness. Absolutely, definitely, man. That that, that was a definitely test of my heart. You know, that my first year, especially going into an individual instruction was, man, that, that's something I'll never. Never forget. Hey, I got I got a plaque for being having the best individual workout. I still I take pride in that plaque. <laughs> hey, that's a plaque I never wanted. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, bro, I thank I thank you for coming on the show, man. Thank I appreciate you. your time, man. It's always good seeing you. You know, you here. definitely did a lot for me my first year, the only year I played with you, but I still felt like you know we had such a bond. That, yeah. you know, that last today we can pick up the phone, you know, call each other, 
um, shoot, the reunion, you know, I still think about that when we all got together, not all of us being together for 20 years and we right. still communicate today, you know, every now and then on the Zoom call. And man, just uh, just thank you for for um, showing up today and, and, and Anytime, sharing. Anytime, brother. You know, you know how to reach me, man. You know how to find me. So Right, exactly. Find. You got my number. So listen, hey, much love to you. Keep doing a phenomenal job with this podcast. I want it to continue to keep growing. So make sure all the listeners, he got something good going. Let's support our man, Barner. Brian Turner, let's do it. <laughs> Thanks, bro. I appreciate it. Yeah. Take care.